to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and verse 14. We welcome you today to our study of the Gospel of John. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast. In this series of lessons, we're going to be looking at John chapters 1 through 3 and thinking about Jesus Christ as the Word, as the light, and as the life. And as we think about these lessons, we want to look at the practical teaching of Jesus and notice how that applies to our life in such a wonderful way. As always, we're so glad that you've joined us for our study together today. We hope that you've got your Bible handy. If you don't, we hope that you'll locate that and, and follow along with us. As always, today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ. Those members of the Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. You'll find friendly folks at the Church of Christ who love the Lord and love the Bible and are always happy to meet people that they do not know. And as we think today about these lessons, if you've got a, a Bible question or if you'd like to study further, friend, we'd love to help you at the Gospel of Christ please visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. You can find all our video lessons. We have a large collection of video lessons. You can find all our video, audio lessons, transcripts, and study questions, as well as various articles to help you in your study of the Word of God. All of that is available free from our website. Also, if you'd like to have a free DVD or CD of today's lesson or any of our lessons, you can call us or write to us or fill out our form from our website and we'll be happy to make that available to you free of charge. Today as we think about the book of John, we want to remind you of the great theme that John sets out in this book. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, Truly, Jesus did many other signs, many other miracles in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life in His name. The book of John is uniquely tied together in such a, a way to show that that great premise, Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is God, is true. And when you believe that and when you follow through with that belief, the Bible teaches we can have eternal life through His name. Now, in chapters 1 through 3 today, we're going to notice some very practical lessons about our Lord and Savior. First, we notice that Jesus is seen in the book of John as the eternal Word, as the Creator, and as God in the flesh. Notice with me John chapter 1, and I want you to look in verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Notice this, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Whoever this is, this Word, this Logos that is being spoken of here, He was with God, He was God, all things were made through Him. Who is this? Well, jump down to chapter 1, verse number 14, and we're clearly told who it is. The Bible says in verse number 14 of the same chapter, and the Word became flesh, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is the only begotten of God that came in flesh in human form? Jesus Christ. Therefore, Jesus was with God, Jesus is God, and Jesus is Creator. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 18. As the eternal Word, Jesus has the power to give life through His Word. 
John 6, verse 68, Peter responded to Jesus by saying, When asked, Do you want to go away also? Peter responded by saying, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. He has the power through His words to save. And my friend, it is His word that we must listen carefully to on matters of spirituality. The Bible says in Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3, God, who at various times and various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, notice this, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. Not only do His words give salvation, but Jesus is God's way, the, the method God has chosen to speak to man today. If I want to know, God, how do you want me to live? God, how do, what do I need to do about salvation? Lord, how do I deal with this situation? God chose His Son to speak to the world today. Therefore, the words I need to listen to are the words of Jesus Christ. Now, here's what's interesting about John 1, verses 1 through 3 as well. Jesus existed prior to creation. In the beginning, the Word was with God. The idea is that not just at the beginning, but from the beginning, from eternity, Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And of course, the record of Genesis confirms Jesus existed before creation. Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27, God said, let, listen to this now, God said, let us, what? Not me. God said, let me, no. God said, let us. Make man in my image? No. Make man in our image. Genesis 2 verse 7, The Lord God breathed in the man the breath of life. Man became a living being. Before the first second on the time of clock tick, before the first grain of sand was formed into mankind, Jesus Christ already existed. Not only did He exist before creation, but God used Him to make all things. Colossians 1 verse 15, all things were made by Him, through Him, for Him. He's the creator of all things is the idea. And so when I think about Jesus and His power, He's that eternal Word, that Word has power. And when I hear God saying, let there be light, who did God use to do that? Jesus was an agent of creation as well. Thus, Jesus is God. The whole point. If Jesus was with God, if Jesus created things, Jesus is God. And that's the whole point that John is trying to make in the Gospel of John. John 10 verse 30, Jesus said it so clearly that it infuriated the Jews and they accused Him of blasphemy, one of the things they would ultimately crucify Him for. Jesus said in John 10 verse 30, I and my Father are one. Claiming to be one with the Father made Him equal with the Father. And for that, they wanted to kill and crucify Jesus. Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11 tells us that although He was God, He humbled Himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He didn't consider equality with God. There's that idea. Something to be held on to. He allowed Himself to come to this earth, but Jesus had equality with God. John 20, verse 28, Thomas said, My Lord and my God. And then, of course, when you think about Jesus as God, as Creator, existing before creation, friend, the natural application is, if He's Creator, then He's my God. I need to serve Him. I need to live for Him. I need to worship Him. And whatever the Lord says, I definitely want to follow His teaching. Now, friend, as you think about this idea, I also want you to notice from John chapter 1 that Jesus not only is God, He is something else. That is, He is identified as the sacrificial Lamb of God. Notice these words. John chapter 1, look in verse number 29 with me. The Bible records this. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Friend, as I think of images of Jesus that are so powerful, that, that are so moving, you can't help but think about that Lamb of God. You've got to take your mind back to the Old Testament sacrificial system. 
in the book of Leviticus, specifically in Leviticus chapters 1 through 5, when sin occurred, there was a price to be paid for that. A heifer or a lamb or something else would take its place. That lamb was to be put in the place of the sin offering. It was to be the sin offering. They would take that pure and spotless lamb uh, they would take it to the priest. They would sacrifice it. They would slaughter it. They would sacrifice it. Its blood would make atonement on the altar for sin. Now, I understand the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin, sin, but that picture of the Lamb of God, something incurring the penalty for my sin. See, I've sinned and you've sinned. Romans 3.23, the wages of my sin is death. Romans 6.23, I deserve to be lost for sin, but something stood in the place. What is that? Jesus, the Lamb of God, stood in my place and He stood in yours. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1 verse 19 that He was planned from before the creation. We're knowing that we're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from our aimless conduct handed down by tradition from our fathers. Here's what you're redeemed with though. But with the precious blood of Christ, with the precious blood of the Lamb, we're made clean and spotless in the sight of God. You see, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And yet, as the writer of Hebrews said, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. And yet Jesus, the Lamb of God, took away my sin and He took away yours. Who could live a perfect life? Not any man today. Who could satisfy the, 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 the justice of God? Not us. And yet Hebrews 4.15 says that Jesus was without sin. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 1 and 2, that He satisfied. His pure, perfect sacrifice was the propitiation. It satisfied the justice of Almighty God. And so as we think about these ideas, we want to clearly understand that Jesus is God and that we must follow Him and His teaching in each and every way. All right, then in John chapter 2, as you think about Jesus, we, we noticed in our last lesson the miracle Jesus did in turning the water to wine, how Jesus could take one substance and turn it to another, and what a great miracle that was and how it proved Jesus as divine. I want you to notice from that miracle a great statement that comes that each person who believes in Jesus must be willing to follow. Look in the words of Jesus' mother. In John chapter 2, I want you to notice what is said in verse number 5. If this isn't, friend, this is one of the greatest mottos for living that's ever been given. John 2 verse 5. When Jesus' mother realizes he's going to do the miracle, here's what is said. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Friend, could you find better advice in all the world for living? Not if you're a Christian. What's it mean to live for Jesus? What's it mean to be a follower of Christ? What's it mean to, to really love the Lord? Here's what it means. Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. I don't have to wonder or if He's God. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to question. I don't have to have doubt or lack of trust in Him. If Jesus is God and the miracle proves that He is, hey, whatever Jesus says, I'm going to, without question and without hesitation, do that because I know He's God and I can trust Him. You see, the Scripture teaches us that if we're going to follow Jesus, we've got to, without hesitation, obey His Word. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, is going there, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. John 6, verse 68, Peter said it so clearly. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation. To who? To all those who obey Him. 1 Peter 2, verse 21, For to this were you called, because Christ also suffered and died, leaving us an example that we should follow in His footsteps. If I want to live the best life, if I want to be really happy, if I want to have joy and peace and comfort, and if I ultimately want to live in heaven, what do I have to do? Well, it's very simple. Whatever He says to you, do it. Ah, oh, those words ought to be etched in every one of our minds. An unwavering, 
unhesitant faith to follow Jesus regardless of what he says or what he asks. Now, as we think about this idea, let's also realize from John chapter 2 that Jesus does know what's in me, in my heart, in my mind, and in your heart, in your mind. Jesus knows what's in us. And I'm not going to fool Jesus. And I'm not, if He's God and He has all the power that John claims, don't even try to fool God. God knows what's in me. How do I know that? Look in John chapter 2, and I want you to look in verse 24 and 25 with me. Here's what the Scripture records. But Jesus did not commit Himself to them, that is the Jews at Jerusalem. Jesus did not commit Himself to them because, now watch this, He knew all men. What do you mean? He had no need that, any, no need that anyone should testify of man, for He knew what was in man. Uh, the Scripture clearly records that God knows my heart and my life. God knows your heart and your life. Listen to Hebrews 4.13. All things are open, naked, before the eyes of Him with whom we must give an account. Luke 16.15, God knows your heart. Proverbs 15, verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. Now for Him... That can go one of two ways for you. If you're a Christian, listen carefully. If you're a Christian, you're trying to live good, you're trying to walk in the light, you are unwaveringly trying to do what Jesus says. Is it a good thing that God knows what's in your heart, what's in your life? Well, absolutely. I want God to know. I want Him to know that I'm trying. I want Him to know the temptations and challenges I face. I want Him to know that I'm trying to give my dead level best every day to serve Him. Now, if I'm not, that could be a bad thing. If I'm trying to hide things, it's very foolish. If my heart is not where it needs to be, if my motives are not pure in serving God, if my heart's not where it needs to be, if I've got sin in my life, friend, I will promise you that sin is open as much as uh, daylight is open to my eyes and your eyes. It's open, it's clear, you're not hiding one shred of that sin from God. God knows what's in our heart and what's in our mind. And thus, we must always try to live in such a way that it brings honor and glory to Almighty God. All right, now let's think about a couple of other things in the time we've got remaining. I want you to turn now to the third chapter. We've seen Jesus as the Word. We've seen Jesus as the giver of life. Now I want you to see in John chapter 3 what Jesus says man must do to get into God's kingdom. What do I need to do to follow Jesus? What does it really mean, whatever Jesus says to you, do it? Well, here would be definitely one of those teachings that a lot of people try to get around. Look at Jesus' words in John chapter 3. I want you to look beginning in verse number 1. Look at the context of Nicodemus. The Bible says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, Teacher, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, this is curious to Nicodemus. He doesn't initially understand it. Jesus says, Nicodemus, I know you're getting the point. I know you're seeing the signs. I know you're making the right conclusion. I am God. Here's what you need to do. Unless one is born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. Lord, what do you mean born again? You, are you saying you want me to somehow get back up in my mother's womb and be physically born again? And Jesus says, here's what I mean. Unless, verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Friend, do you want to be in God's kingdom? Do you want to live with God in heaven one day? Friend, this passage clearly teaches us that I must be born of water and I must be born of the Spirit to get into God's kingdom. Now, when Jesus said born of water, what's He mean? Well, friend, the Bible teaches us that being born of water is being baptized into the kingdom of God. Titus 3 verse 5, it is referred to as the washing of regeneration or the bath 
of new birth. Ephesians 5 verse 26, those who are in the church are washed and cleansed. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 gives the picture. If anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. How do you get washed? How do you get cleansed? How do you get all those old things put away? By being baptized. How do we know that? Let me give you some examples. New birth, right? Romans 6 verses 1 through 4. There is a death, burial, and resurrection process to the new birth. The Bible says that we die to sin, we're buried with Christ in baptism, and we rise up out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life. Death, burial, birth. We're born again. That's the idea. Acts 2 verse 38, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. You remember we're, we're cleansed, we're washed, old things are put away. When's that happen? At the point of baptism. How do I know that? Let me give you two other Bible verses. In Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6, Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, is confronted by Jesus. And the Lord says to him, I want you to go into the city and I'll tell you what you must do. Ananias is sent by the Lord to the city. And he approaches Saul of Tarsus in Acts 22, 16. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Baptism is the point at which sins are washed away. We're cleansed, we're washed. We're, is there something mystical or magical? It's not what we're saying. It's not something mystical or magical in the water, but friend, God told us to do it. And therefore, that makes it essential in God's plan. Now, remember Jesus, the one who has the eternal words of life? Here's what He said. Jesus said it so clearly. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Friend, must you be born of water and the Spirit to get into God's kingdom? Absolutely. What's it mean to be born of water? To be baptized into the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Galatians 3 verse 27. Being born of the Spirit means we're born by the Spirit's Word. 1 Peter 1 verse 23 says this, we're born again. Here it is. We're born again by the Word of God which lives and endures forever. Well, who inspired that Word? The Holy Spirit, John 16, 13. And so I'm born again by the Word of God, by the Spirit's Word, being born of the Spirit, and we're born in water. And friend, you cannot get into God's kingdom without either one of those things taking place. Now friend, as you think about this idea, we want you to listen real carefully to one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible that tells us why God wants us to be a part of His kingdom, why He sent His Son to the world. Ah, oh, that verse, John 3, 16. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What's the motivation? Why did God make salvation available? Why did God send His own Son to, to die for me? Why the cross? Why the beating? Why the mockery? Why all of that? God so loved the world. That's how much God loved you and God loved me. You see, God is love. 1 John 4 verse 8. While we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one might die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And friend, I want to illustrate that if one is going to be obedient to the gospel, you've got to do more uh, than just acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God. You've got to obey God's plan of salvation. Now, sometimes I hear people teach that all you've got to do is believe, and, and believing is just all belief means is to accept Jesus as Savior. Friend, that's not even true according to Scripture. The American Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, the English Standard Bible, here's how they translate a verse in John chapter 3, verse number 36. And this follows in line with the Greek New Testament. John 3, verse 36, and the American Standard says, He that believeth on the Son has eternal life, but he that obeyeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Do you get those two synonyms? He that believeth on the Son has eternal life. Watch this now. But he that obeyeth not, 
What is a synonym there for belief? Obey. He that believeth the Son has eternal life. He that obeyeth not shall not see life. Those words are used interchangeably. What does it mean to believe, to obey? Friend, if it, believing is not just saying, okay, I accept a fact. In the Bible, belief is always active. It's not something that I just accept here. I've got, I've got to realize that's true. But in the Bible, belief is followed with a verb. They believe, therefore. Uh, their faith made them, you know, belief is always putting together and obeying what God wants us to do. And so our encouragement today, as we think about Jesus as the Son of God, as we think about Him as God in the flesh, the, the Word, the life, and the light, here's the encouragement today. Friend, are you a Christian? Have you obeyed the teaching of Jesus Christ? Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. Have you done that? If you're not a child of God, we're, we're begging you, we're urging you today. Jesus came so that you might have eternal life. Jesus died on a cruel cross so that I could have the hope of heaven. More than anything, God wants us to be saved. But we've got to do what the Bible teaches. Now, I know there's a host and a variety of ways that man have made to give man salvation or methods man has. But only thing that matters is, what does Jesus say? Lord, how do I get in your kingdom? Well, Jesus made it clear. Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You've got to no doubt believe in Jesus. John 8, 24. You have to be willing to change your life and repent, turn from sin and turn to God. Acts 3, verse 19. You've got to acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Romans 10, verse 10. And friend, the Bible clearly teaches to get in God's kingdom and to be saved. You're first baptized. You're not saved and then baptized. That's the way the world says it. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. And so we hope today that each of us have been encouraged as we think about Jesus as God and that it will bring us to the ultimate conclusion. Whatever Jesus says, I want to do it. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 Four five eight three nine zero five, or write to us at P.O. Box seven eight eight, McMinnville, Tennessee three seven one one one.